CBS MacKaiser on 702, your number one news and talk station. And of course, as promised, we are in conversation here in studio live with the author of the sensational book, The President's Keepers. This book hasn't been out for more than about two weeks, maybe even slightly less. And it's already now, if uh, my count is correct, on a fourth print run. And by the end of this week, some 55,000 copies would already have been printed. So even with all the PDFs that are doing the round, it is already doing absolutely remarkably well and um, already on its current sales will be one of the best-selling books of the last several years in this country. And it's still growing legs, and it's going to do even more, uh, even better than that, and for very good reason. It is, as I said before, the smoking gun. Where's our Facebook streaming coming from? There in the corner. There's the smoking gun. And that's why the spooks don't like this book. Okay, so use the hashtag Jacques on Eusebius. You can tell me what comes up for you as you listen to the author. What questions should I put to him that are the most important before we run out and he's off to the next media blitz. And of course, you can also call in 11 in Johannesburg and in Cape Town on 21 Jacques, thank you so much for coming in. I really do appreciate it. Hello, Eusebius. I'm glad to be here. Congratulations. Thank you. How are you feeling? I feel a bit overwhelmed. You know, when I, before the book was published, I knew it was going to elicit some reaction from the from the law enforcement agencies. I never expected anything like this. I, I, I also didn't expect the support from the, from the public out there. Mm. I want us to start off by introducing the public to a man whose name should be a household name, but isn't. And he already hates you for now turning him into a household name. Arthur Fraser. Mm. Who is he? Arthur, Arthur Fraser, um, there was some publicity around Arthur, Thra- Arthur Fraser around 2007, 2006, 2007, when the so-called Browse Mole report emerged that implicated Jacob Zuma and all kinds of nasty um, nasty actions, but the browse mole report in the end was planted on Jacob Zuma to discredit him. Anyway, Fraser was the man that investigated browse mole, and the Morning Guardian then wrote um, an article. He was at the time the Deputy Director General of uh, State Security, and the Morning Guardian at the time wrote a story that he, during this investigation into browse mole, he discovered the spy tapes. He came upon the spy tapes, and he was the man that gave the spy tapes to to Michael Halley and to Jacob Zuma. And by doing that, he probably armored himself. Mm. And then he very quietly resigned in 2011. What people didn't know is that he resigned at the time because there was a massive investigation against him for fraud and corruption Mm. um, that included probably a billion rand of taxpayers' money that was wasted on the most... My God, ridiculous project at at state security they forged um uh, ronnie Castrell's signature for example they appointed a host of agents to work on on all kinds of projects from uh, from gangsterism to terrorism to 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 organized crime um they they produced very little of of any value they bought um th- they had three warehouses full of cars um, they bought houses. There was a case where I think they bought they bought a farm. They bought all kinds of spy equipment. Um, you know, this, the 72 agents had 293 cars between them. Um, Fraser appointed family members to work for the so-called PAN project. And as I said, over a period of about two, three years, they wasted a billion rand of taxpayers' money. The PAN project was... Uh, was investigated by an internal team at state security consisting of advocates and accountants and they thought that there was and they 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 in the end concluded after a, nearly a two year investigation that there was massive uh, fraud and corruption and that at least 10 senior pan agents including Fraser and uh, 
and the people under him had to stand trial for fraud and corruption. And it's a family affair, isn't it, Jacques? On page 42, Jacques writes the following. SARS investigators and analysts compiled profiles of the managers slash agents as well as their spouses and connected the dots between the companies and their directors. Although most of the pay and transactions and payments were done in cash, it was clear that several of the persons of interest had feasted greedily during their terms at PAN. One of the PAN agents who acted as a service provider had eight vehicles registered in his name, including a 1.3 million Merc, a Range Rover Sport, an Audi A4, a Bajero, and a Harley Davidson. He was an active and former director of more than 20 companies. One of these companies received 27 government payments worth 5.6 million, another 57 worth 10 million. The latter still owed 5.6 in unpaid taxes. But here's the interesting bit. He goes on, and towards the end of this little section, the following is what Jack writes. The profile of Arthur Fraser, however, didn't show excessive wealth. But here's the kicker. He owned two BMWs in a house in Observatory in Johannesburg and was director of a couple of companies. He did, though, receive two government tenders of 81000 while he was operations director at NIA. But the profile of his wife... Natasha Fraser made for more interesting reading. She became a director of a security company by using her maiden name of Taylor. After she resigned from the company, it received 240 government payments between 2005 and 2010 to the value of 7.4 million runs. It also owed SARS almost 4 million rand in unpaid taxes. This is a family affair. Yeah, it was it was very much a family affair. Um, his brother was was employed. His son was employed. His mother was registered. It was a it was a family affair. So much so that even one dodgy example you mention is how, in the order of ten million rand, supposedly went for a community project in the family's name. Yeah, I mean he he objected he objected against that yesterday. When I invited him to come on, he the family has declined. Well, the family yesterday said, "Is how could I have said that Mrs. C. F. Fraser, who is 83, was a pan agent?" Well, what I said is, no, she wasn't an agent to go and scrounge around on the Cape Flats to look for gangsters and and terrorists and whatever. She, uh, what I said is that she was a board member of a community-based organization that dealt with conflict resolution at schools. And Pan contributed 10 million rand towards that organization, although it had absolutely nothing to do with national security. Um, and this is about seven, eight years ago. She was so she was not 83 then. So it's very misleading what they said yesterday. The other connection here, the other dot to draw for people, is that Arthur has a famous sister. Yeah, Moliketsi Fraser, absolutely. She Geraldine. A, yes, she was a cabinet minister. She's mentioned and then dropped. Did she know about these shenanigans or not? I have absolutely no idea. I have no idea. We've had many brilliant books this year. You know we've had so many great author interviews. I do not say this lightly. This is the most one of the most important books of the last 20 plus years in this country and definitely uh, this year. Jacques, let's get into some of the granular detail in terms of how the spooks operate. One very important insight from the book for me is that the reason why the spooks can get away with irregular spending of possibly upwards of 1 billion rand is because they can pretend that the normal values around transparency that we adopted post-1994 cannot apply to the spooks because if you have to look after the country and keep you and I safe at night, then the auditors should not be let near the books. Absolutely. You know, as, as you and I sit here, we're not allowed to know what state security spend on projects. We're not allowed to know what their budget is. You and I are not allowed to know how many people work there. I can tell you how many people work there and what their budget is, but you might get into trouble. So it's completely ridiculous. Their their, their operational budget, um, the budget that funds the projects and the operations, are not audited by the by the auditor general, and there's, there's this complete. Um, secrecy surrounding the, the the state security agency. Now we know from experience from the crime intelligence unit, for example, we know what happens when there's secret funds and secret money and money that's not accountable for. It disappears into a big 
black hole. State security spend billions every year. Crime intelligence spends billions every year. Where's that money going to? Where is it? Crime intelligence has got a secret fund at the mo- that's at the moment between 500 and 700 million rand a year. What value are we getting for for that money? Crime intelligence is in absolute shambles. It's in it's been in shambles for for the last seven years since um, Richard Madluli was suspended. He's in fact still the the commander of the crime intelligence unit. Commissioner after commissioner after commissioner has failed to to institute criminal uh, disciplinary proceedings against him. So he's still the head of the unit. He still he still gets his salary every month. He even received a bonus. Um, so what is what 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 are these these agencies doing with all their money? Because crime is rising. Um, we can see it. We can feel it. Um, the murder rate is up. Cash, cash in transit heists are up. What's happening with all this money? Why is why? When is the last time you've seen um, we you've seen a, 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 a major criminal criminal syndicate being arrested and brought to book? It hasn't happened for a very very long time. SARS used to do it. Hmm. They're not doing it anymore either. But it gets worse. The story that is because the first big problem for South Africa Inc is that the spooks are stealing from you and me. But in addition to that, you also tell the story, and I want us to pause here so you can tell the public some of the key detail. You also have, just as in the Republic of Gupta, we learn with Peter Louis Mayberg how the Saxon Wall should be in, is an alternative source of executive power. In a similar kind of way, it is not clear where the de facto headquarters of the state security agency is, because while being at the center of the looting and the theft, Arthur Fraser, the brother of Geraldine, Fraser Moloketi, also finds himself at his home having sources of intelligence that doesn't necessarily get taken to headquarters. It's such a bizarre situation, and I don't know why why Fraser is not explaining that to us because that doesn't that that's he's not going to give any secrets away. It doesn't it doesn't concern um, national security. When he ran the, the the Pan project, he had a server installed in his house, his own personal server, and these Pan agents. I don't want to make it too complicated, but these Pan agents had to send their reports their intelligence reports to his server at his home and from there he would decide what he was going to send into the mainframe at at state security headquarters when uh, this the the state security agency investigators found 800 examples of intelligence reports that were not sent into the mainframe and they came to the conclusion that he was attempting to set up a parallel intelligence network and that because of this he's probably guilty of treason nothing ever came of that and we still need an explanation why why the the deputy head not not even the director general at that stage why the deputy director general had his own personal server in his house that is quite scary it's very scary Absolutely. And the fact, I think what is even more scary is that nothing was done about it. You know, if you think, and I I incidentally spoke to Ronnie Casserles last night, and we spoke about the fact that these people, um, that these agents also forged his signature. Mm. Because, once again, I'm not going to make it complicated. Casserles, in principle, agreed. Uh, to, he agreed to the expansion of the intelligence network. And he, in principle, agreed that that PAN should be set up, and he signed that document. That signature was then pasted onto other documents that was used to get the money from the, from the finance department at State Security. And he said to me last night, he clearly remembers how... Um, how the investigators came to him and they showed him the different documents. And they said to him, Mr. Casseroles, is this your signature? And he said, yes, it's my signature. It looks like my signature, but I've never seen that document. And he now plans to take criminal steps, Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, steps under the state. It's certainly fraud. It's certainly corruption. It certainly um, concerns the Intelligence Act. So he clearly remembers it. But nothing has ever been explained to the public Mm -hmm. out there. Everything just gets... 
hidden somewhere. As we've seen with state capture, Jacques, the only time, well, there, there are different ways in which the information drips, drips, drips into the open society. Mm. When excellent investigative journalists like you do country duty, or secondly, and or secondly, when there are whistleblowers who do good and do country duty, or of course, as we are currently seeing with state capture in particular, when the thieves are tripping over each other. Mm. And I want you to tell the story of where the beginning of shining light on the darkness of the spooks happened. And I think a pivotal moment in the story is when the internal auditors, of course, go on a raid. Unbeknownst to them, there are CCTV cameras in the next room. I mean, that is a fascinating passage of thriller writing. It would be more amusing if it wasn't so serious. Yeah, when the, when when Gibson Jenjay appointed the the internal investigators, and amongst them were two advocates, auditor, uh, a person from human resources. And they then informed the PAN, the people at the PAN office, because they worked away, they worked in their own their own building away from headquarters. So they informed the PAN people that, the PAN agents, that they're coming for an internal audit. They want to check everything. And then PAN decided, the PAN agents decided they're going to put CCTV cameras in the room where the auditors or where the investigators are going to work. They put in the CCTV cameras or the spy cameras, whatever you want to call them, but then they switched them on um, far too soon. Mm. And the CCTV cameras then showed them working through the night to produce documentation and to make receipts and to register agents and whatever. So when the when the when the when the when the, when the auditors arrived the next morning, I mean, the, the the CCTV cameras had already been on for uh, for about eight hours or so. Now, I remember <laughs> thinking that. I don't know whether they had been drinking brandy and coke that night. <laughs> it must have been it, it seemed as, the, as, <laughs> as, the, as the night was going on, they were making more and more mistakes with their, with their fake and manufactured documents. And then eventually, when they started, started closing in on the PAN agents, they got the CCTV footage showing how they manufactured the documentation and the evidence. Well, thank God for Clippies and Coke. Absolutely. <laughs> I want to move to the next segment. We're going to have to take a break in a second. But for me, the next big theme in your book, which is really tragic, and it segues nicely from the rot at the state security agency to SARS. And it's mm. going to take us a good 10 minutes to get to the essence of it. But it's, 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 and I want to start at a high level, well, then we'll take the break, and then we'll deep dive into the details, Jacques. But isn't it sad that the sort of, I've been referring to them as the head prefect among state agencies or state departments in this country for a long time has been the South African Revenue Service, mm. even as shenanigans in the SAPs. The scorpions and then yeah. the hawks happened. We could rely yeah. on men and women behaving with integrity. And for Zuma and for the president's keepers, SARS was clearly always an obstacle. Yeah, because because SARS had had magnificent people working for them. And these were people that were not aligned to any party or any politician or to any any faction in government. This was a this, this was an organisation that, while when as we progressed after Jacob Zuma's um, uh, after Jacob Zuma became president, and we we started seeing that people like Hawks, uh, Hawkshead, Anwar Dramat, for example, um, disappeared, was worked out of the system. SARS was still there to uh, to go after organised criminals, and they brought down people like Lali Jackson and Radovan Kretscher and Glenn Agliati and all these people. But they were also prepared to treat everyone in this country as an ordinary taxpayer. And that included the right. president. And that led to their downfall. Let's tell people, in essence, they must buy the book for the full story. But for the radio shortened version, Jacques, the story of how the Gordon Four, in particular at SARS, were an obstacle to the president and his keepers. And the president needed to get someone like Tom Moyane in there. And he also needed to 
willfully turn a blind eye to what Johann van Lochrenberg was telling him because he knew that everyone from the smugglers of illicit cigarettes to gangsters on the Cape Flats did not like the people with integrity at SARS. We have to, we have to distinguish between two SARS regimes here. There's the first SARS regime of people like Opa Magashule and Ivan, Ivan Pillay and Johan van Lochrenberg and many others. That lasted until the end of 2014, and the date here is very important. And then Tamoyani came in in 2014. Now, under the old SARS regime, this was, this was the SARS that hunted down organized criminals. The SARS that was prepared to treat everyone like a normal taxpayer. Now, when Zuma um, came to office in May 2009, he was tax compliant. And SARS helped to make him tax compliant before he became president. Um, they had lots of problems already with, with him then, but he eventually became, became tax compliant. But then after he became president, he didn't submit his tax returns for the first five years of his, of his presidency, which led to, the, to, to a situation in 2011, um, 2012, 2011, 2012, where SARS saw him and his, um, his attorney, Michael Halley, regularly where they pleaded with the president to please submit his tax returns. And they wouldn't say to him why it was so important for him to, to submit his tax returns, but, the, but, but by then, for example, they had already discovered the fact that for a year before he became president and for four months into his president, he was paid a million rand a month by security tycoon um, Roy Moodley right. in, in KwaZulu Natal. And it's very interesting, you know, Zuma was the was the, the guest of honor at Roy Moodley's fiftieth birthday celebration at the International Convention Center in Durban. And uh, Moodley's son made the made a speech that night. And with Zuma sitting there he said, My father is the most powerful <coughs> man in the country. And now we know why he was he was saying that. So SARS already, when they started when they started pleading with with Halley and with Zuma, for the president to submit his tax returns, knew that they were the Roy Moodley payments, which w would have made it difficult for the president to submit the tax returns because he didn't know what SARS had, what ammunition they had. The second problem the president face, faces um, was with the upgrades of Nkandla. Now, I quote the legislation extensively in my book, and I'm not going to do it, to do it uh, on air. But SARS, the SARS calculated that the president owes just over 63 million rand for the upgrades. Now, there was an out for President Zuma. He could have gone to Parliament, and he could have asked Parliament to, um, to, to declare or to find that he doesn't own any any tax on the upgrades at, at Nkandla. But at the time, he was very arrogant about the upgrades. And he said, I'm not going to pay. I didn't know about it, which we all but know by now was a lie. So so this, this, this culminated in a meeting in February 2014, and I have documentation about it, where Ivan Pillay, who was the acting SARS commissioner, saw Zuma in his office in the union buildings, and he said to him, Mr. President, please... We can't wait any longer for your tax returns. You have to become tax compliant. And he then warns Zuma that he, we are not going to treat you any different than any taxpayer. That left Zuma with a predicament. That he, he, now, what could have happened then if he didn't submit his tax returns, they could have done a full-scale audit on the president. That could have led in the end to the to the insolvency of, of Jacob Zuma. And an insolvent cannot be the president of the country. So at that point, SARS became a terrible threat to Ivan Pillay. And I want to underscore that insight in terms of one of the political storylines throughout this book, Jacques, because a lot of people think all Zuma and his cronies want is to continue eating at the trough. But the problem is, in accounting terms, that some of the activity, even if you could get away with reclassify them as lawful gifts, mm. nevertheless, the size of the tax bill 
made people like Johan a problem for Zuma. Yeah, it made him a problem for Zuma. It also made other investigations also made him a problem for the for the made made him a problem for the Zuma family. For example, at the time, SARS was busy taking down um, was taking down a group of tobacco dealers. Um, amongst them, people like Yusuf Kaji and and Azima Motkarim and people like that, they were making huge payments to Edward Zuma on a monthly basis. And I, I've got all the SMSs and I've got the the the, the bookkeeping spreadsheets and whatever. How huge am- amounts of mon- money flow to flow to Edward Zuma gangsters like Lloyd Hill, who's closely connected to the to the Zuma family. On a monthly basis, these people would also have been brought down by, by SARS because they were at that time they were, in essence, receiving the proceeds of crime. Yeah. Because this was the money yeah. that came from smuggled tobacco. Um, but now you must remember this was not only happening in SARS. It was the same time happening in in the Hawks, for example. And I'm jumping now a little bit, where someone like General Johan Boysen, who was the head of the Hawks in KwaZulu Natal, was on virtually permanent um, suspension from 2011 onwards because he was investigating a Zuma crony by the no- by the name of Panday. So the same happened in other law enforcement agencies as well okay so let's let's fast forward the story here just in the interest of time so despite the likes of johan pleading with the president at one point ivan, Pillay ivan pleading, ivan yes, pleading yes. They, they come they, they come before the president and they say to number one listen we are now even aware that there are some people who are hell-bent on discrediting us yeah and that is a fascinating part of the story because Suddenly, those of us who don't know what goes on at SARS, we open the Sunday Times and we see the story emerging. And without knowing what you have now chronicled in this book, we have, as unsuspecting readers, fresh ideas about who the good guys and the bad guys are. And here again, if you had submitted this as a movie script to an investor, they'd say to you, Jacques, this is just too fantastical. Yeah. Because you even have one of the good guys, like all human beings and emotions and getting a bit horny, you you know, and your own folly, you find yourself also falling in love with someone who turns out to be a spy. Mm. I mean, I dropped my, my you, mug of coffee at that you, part in the book. You can't you can't you can't write, you can't a, make it write up. a movie script like this. No. So the, so not 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 long after after um, or, or virtually at the same time that, that Pelé saw Johan van Lochrenberg, he was befriended and, well, seduced, basically. But he participated, he's not innocent, by, uh, by, a, Pretoria, by a Pretoria attorney who t- also turned, to, uh, turned out to be an, an SSA agent. And what later emerged through SMSs and other documentation is that there was, a, there was an orchestrated campaign by elements in the state security agency to remove the top structure of SARS. And I have a, a letter, for example, from, from this Pretoria attorney where she says there's an orchestrated campaign to remove the top structure of SARS. So the first was the first to go was Johan van Lochrenberg because of this honey trap attorney that he befriended. Then suddenly Ivan Pele was suspended. Moyani came in. Two weeks after Moyani came in, the Sunday Times started screaming um, rogue unit at SARS. They ran a brothel. They spied on President Zuma. They were involved in other dirty tricks, which led to a purge of the top structure of SARS, which is exactly what they aim You criticize the media at this point. On page 156, you write the following. The Sunday Times journalist, Pete Rampedi, Stefan Hofstetter and Mzilla Kaziwa Africa have contributed greatly to ending the careers of dedicated civil servants and ultimately enabled Tom Moyane to break the tax collector. It took the best part of a year for the Sunday Times stories to start falling apart. The press ombudsman ruled against the Sunday Times and found that it rogue unit stories were unfair and inaccurate. Rampedi started a newspaper called the African Times, and then you say parenthetically, who the hell starts a newspaper these days unless you have government or Gupta funding, and you go on um, to also 
talk about how some of these guys even fooled my now colleague here, Bongani Bingwa, uh, on a card blanche episode um, when he spoke to, um, I think it was Michael uh, Piga, yeah. who gave, as you say, an Oscar winning performance. And then you say, sorry, Bongani, with tears in his eyes presented, Bongani Bingwa said, Michael is now hoping that the seven year battle to claw back his integrity is finally over. Our colleagues in the media, in particular Stefan, Pitt and Mzela Kazi, did they make honest mistakes or were they behaving unethically? You know, I had a meeting with uh, with Stefan Hofstadter in February, February this year where I asked him that exact question is, why did you write it? He maintains that they had, um, they had credible sources, that some of the stuff they write was in fact true. So I don't know. I mean, I think I think we must we must ask them whether it was an honest mistake or whether there was something mm. something deeper around. Well, we will ask you, Stefan. I know you're exceptionally busy. I appreciate the fact that you not only want to respond to Jacques in terms of the cameo appearance of your name in this story, but that you came into studio, which for us as broadcasters is always a, a bonus in terms of audio quality. Thanks so much for being here. Ah, oh, Eusebius. Yeah, thanks very much for actually giving me the opportunity to chat about my cameo role. Because it's a very minor role. Why? Why do you feel, besides the fact that we've extended the opportunity, why do you? Why do you feel you need to respond to it? And what do you want to say? Look, I mean, the thing is, firstly, I'm 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 not here on behalf of the Sunday Times. I worked on these stories while I was at the Sunday Times. I'm at Business Day and Financial Mail now. I'm also not here on behalf of the other colleagues that are mentioned in the book. I think there were three or four who are mentioned. Um, I, I really just, uh, yeah, I, I suppose I feel like having a having a, a chat about you know my own experiences and, and how they relate. And I, I think that, um, I guess I also just wanna make it clear that when it comes to the SARS story itself, um, I wasn't the lead writer on that story. So there were you know areas in it that I wasn't personally involved in. So it's gonna be difficult to drill down into, into that kind of detail. But I wanna make a general point, and that is that um, because Jacques raises this with some of the other stories that myself and particularly my colleague Mzali Kaziwa Africa wrote, that, that he seems to have relied on some people who have access to grind in some parts of his book. And I really think that, you know, that means that those people have a particular agenda to push a particular line. And when it comes to the SARS one, even though I wasn't the lead writer, I did give get access to a lot of documentation and a lot of evidence of wrongdoing. And, you know, again, people who um, reviewed that evidence, I mean, there's advocate Nazreen Raja Budlinder, there's advocate Muzi Sikakani, there's a panel headed by retired judge Frank Kruen, appointed by Mshlantla Nene, and then there's KPMG partner Johan van der Walt, who himself wrote an incredibly damning uh, detailed forensic report into Jacob Zuma's tax affairs, which should have been used in 2006 to go after his tax affairs, and wasn't, because, of course, in 2006, half the people who are crowing after, you know, Jacob, Jacob Zuma must go where his biggest uh, prey singers in 2006. So I just feel that some of these aspects were ignored in Jacques' book, which I have to confess, I haven't read the whole book. Um, the work that he's done on, on, you know, the looting of the state security agency, from what I've heard, it's incredibly important and brave work. Myself and Abzili Kazi have also exposed looting of state security funds. That's certainly a big issue. And I'm really glad he's raised that. And I'm glad he's raised the issues he has with with President Zuma, but yeah, I just I guess I felt it was but a little you, unfair to frame you, us. You, you are the investigative journalist, I'm not, but I would imagine, uh, Stefan, that you guys, every single person that phones you and says, listen, fly out to Moscow, I've got a story for you, I've got an axe to grind, you always have to be suspicious of motive. So we will never settle differences in stories in terms of what is truth and what is not truth by delving only into the motives of the people that call you guys up for interviews, Absolutely. whether it be at the Wimpy on the R21, sure. Moscow, or, you know. In, Absolutely. In, yeah. no, so, so, so I completely a, agree so, with that. So, so, so I want to ask you this pointed question then. Yeah. The rogue unit saga, as it's come to be known, in essence, as it was week after week published in the Sunday Times, it was bogus, wasn't it? At its core. No. I'm not here to, as I said, as not being the lead writer, not representing the newspaper. Uh, the newspaper has apologized for mistakes that were made. 
and I'm not here to get into all of that detail, okay? But, but, but when you say but, no, but, what do you mean by that? But I'm saying that when Judge Frank Kroon stood up and said, I found evidence of wrongful acts committed, I, I can't consider that completely bogus. When Johan van der Walt, um, who stands by his report, even though the conclusions and the findings were withdrawn, but the findings in the body of the report, which we reviewed something like 860,000 emails and all the rest of it, found serious conflicts of interest in some of the SARS officials, and he found some possibly criminal acts like planting bugging devices in the offices of Vusi Pekoli um, during okay. massive high-profile uh, investigations into Jackie Seleba and Jacob Zuma because, he, because the people who planted them there wanted to be kingmakers. Um, that's a pretty rogue act. So, okay. no, Jack, I want you to, I want you to respond there because if what Stefan is saying is accurate, then an important plank in your book must be kicked out. You know, when, when they, for example, wrote the story about the fact that the rogue unit has spied on Jacob Zuma, that story was accompanied by, the, by a photograph of Johan van Lochrenberg. Johan van Lochrenberg only became the head of the unit in, two th in, in 2007. When did the bugging take place? As I said, I'm not getting no, into no, the no. details the bugging, of the, the story. No, no, no. The bugging took place in, in, in 2002, fact, in fact, the 2005 and 2006. You mentioned it. In fact, you mentioned it. No, it no, was no, no. complete nonsense. I mentioned the bugging of Vusi Pekoli. I, I mentioned the bugging of Hold on one second. Vusi Vusi tax man's office. rogue unit ran brothel, an article you wrote on the 9th of November, November 2014. Can, can we just where's, get back where's, to the bugging? Where's the brothel? Can we just get back to the bugging? Yes. The bugging was of Vusi Pekoli's office and the NPA's office. What I'm saying is your article was wrong. It had nothing to do with Johan van Lochrenberg. You put his photograph on the front page with a story. With the story of running a brothel. No, the story with 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 running the running the spy the spy, uh, the spying on the on the president as well. I want to ask you: Was there a brothel? There was a memo. No, no, an internal I, memo of a SARS official saying he was pissed off that he was at what he called a brothel and one of his colleagues got into a fight about having to pay for prostitutes, which what? was in 2007. Now, as we all know, brothels can be run and shut down in three days. I wrote a story exposing a brothel the day after I did it, and that was Michael Sinn in Stephen, brothel. Are you, it are was you, shut are, down. Are you actually can sitting I prove there? Can there was a brothel? No. Is so why, brothel? why do you write it? Because there was a memo of somebody By one, person, one, one disgruntled person called Michael Piecha. Uh, he didn't write the memo, no. By one disgruntled member. Um, a disgruntled member. Well, you, I don't you know, know if he was you know, disgruntled. You know, Stefan, I had a meeting with you in February. We sat together in, in Rosebank, in Parkers. We had coffee. You then said to me that at the time of the SARS rogue unit stories, you were going through through terrible, ex terrible personal problems and th that you would wake up on a Sunday morning and you would not recognize your name on a story. Do you remember me telling me that? I remember mentioning I went through some t terrible personal problems, but are they not the issues that I'd like to raise here? And that you couldn't remember your name on a story? Yeah, uh, I may have said that. Okay. What is the implication of that journalistically, Jacques? I think it is absolutely outrageous for a journalist to say that my name is on a story, but I'm actually not taking any responsibility for it. And to say that you were not the lead writer, you shared the byline, you shared the glory at the time. Stefan, your final response to that? My response to that is that I would have liked to have done things differently. I would have liked to include more context. I would have liked to include more rigor in the way that I wrote the stories. And I didn't do that, and I take responsibility for not insisting on more context and more rigor at the time. And as I said to you... But I'm let's be precise, Stefan. I'm sorry, the, the would-be lawyer in me wants more precision. When you say you'd have liked more rigor, which specific factual claims in the narrative of the rogue unit are you not able, as you sit here and look at me, to say, I verified that as fact? I wasn't able to spend enough time interrogating the sources, interrogating their motives. Sources about which claims? The brothel? The brothel was based on a memo. So for all we know, there could be no brothel as we sit here? Correct. How can but, you but not be there was a reference to it in a memo. Uh, How can that not impugn the integrity of you and your colleagues? We wrote a story based on a memo that said there's a complaint about a brothel. Any journalist who received a memo like that would have said, this is a great story. And a brilliant journalist will go a step further and triangulate. 
Correct. You didn't? I didn't, and that's a mistake. Okay, let's leave it there. Hashtag Jacques on Eusebius. Um, the publishing Jacques has, and I apologize to the person who's going to lose out on the interview that's now going to be cancelled. He's going to be with us for another five to ten minutes. We start taking your reactions as well, but Jacques will be with us just for another five, ten minutes. I have Catholic guilt. If you want the book, it's and thousands of copies will be available in bookstores again within the next day or so. And exclusive books Hyde Park tomorrow night, Wednesday night. Make sure that you are there. I reckon, quote me, it's going to be a launch as big, if not bigger, as the Ready Clubby launch. And you know how gigantic that launch was. 6 for 6.30 tomorrow night at Hyde Park. Um, and at least a thousand books will be available tomorrow on sale. So hopefully everyone who wants a book can get a book. And um, you're going to be there signing until 11 o'clock, dude. I hope you have Clippies and Coke, Jacques. I'm having uh, the first one at 3 o'clock <laughs> tomorrow afternoon. So... I can't get through all of your tweets. I'll do so once uh, um, Jacques has moved on and you and I are alone for the rest of this hour. So I want to get to one or two more themes in the book. If you think the media critique that you've just heard and what Stefan Hofstadt has said was was spicy, there's other stuff in this book that is amazing, Jacques. And I just I just want to tantalize the public and then we leave it there and then we'll have a for yourself. Tom Moyane, as I said to my colleague Daneo here at the beginning of the show, there's sort of like an air of dodginess about the guy. But he has a history, just like Zuma, and their connections are fascinating. Let's give people a bit of color. And unfortunately, the color is also quite lethal. This man found himself first meeting Jacob Zuma when they became chomis initially, when he was in Mozambique. And you tell the story, including the scene of an AK-47. Yeah, I mean, you know, Tamoyani and Jacob Zima come a long, long way. You know, Tamoyani a while ago um, said that um, he grew up with one of Jacob Zuma's um, um, sisters and that she was in fact like, like, like a sister to him. When he, went, when he went into exile, he looked after Jacob Zuma's kids and they were, they were comrades. They were, co- they were in fact comrades in arms. Now, to the credit of, of Tomoyani is he one of, was one of the very few ANC students that survived at the Eduardo Mondlani University in uh, in Maputo, where he actually where he actually graduated, but there's 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 documents that 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 tell debriefing documents that tells how at the time for example he occupied a uh, he lived in a flat in one of the high rise buildings in in Maputo and how one night he shot he shot dead an intruder and had to make up a story um um how he took the the AK from the man and then and then defended himself um you know he he it it I think it it is frightening that a man who's whose highest post in government previously was that of prison's boss, was then, was then appointed as the commissioner of the South African Revenue Service. But he's got a, he's got a long history with Zuma. He also sat on the, on the panel, panel that had to, had to hear about the infamous Gupta landing at Waterkloof. I think it was in 2013, wasn't it? He sat on that panel, and of course it exonerated Jacob Zuma um, or anybody else of any, of any, of any wrongdoing. Um, so yes, I mean, he's been, he's been a comrade for a long time. But he's been extremely useful to Zuma based on those historical connections, because even at the point where we spoke earlier, before we talked about the media falling for the rogue unit um, narrative, mm-hmm. we spoke about Zuma, the tax evader. Now, the problem for Zuma is that some files under lock and key could really indict him. Yeah. And Tom was useful because even long after Johan was cliffed, he was called back momentarily. Mm. And stuff moved from one location to being under the eye of Tom. Yes. Tell the public about that. Well, you know, when, when Van Lochrenberg was suspended, um, he got a call one day um, and he said he had to come into the office. Now, he had a, he had a safe in his, in his office and it was probably, probably the safest safe in SARS. Uh, one you would expect at the State Security Agency or the Hawks and whatever, and in this safe was extremely uh, sensitive files about certain taxpayers and about certain tax investigations. And he was then told to take out the files. Um, there was an inventory was made and all the files was then carried to, to the highest office 
offers at SARS. Now, you know, when, when Jacob, Jacob Zuma didn't really comment on my book, but what he did say is that, number one, he's tax compliant and that there are no payments that he has not declared to the authorities. And I say in my book that it is quite possible that Zuma has become tax compliant after Moyani took over and that Moyani has helped him to become tax compliant. What we want to know is what payments um, have Zuma declared in his tax returns and has he declared the upgrades of Nkandla and has he in fact paid his taxes on it? Okay. Two final questions for you and then we leave it there. The rest, I'm afraid, you will find in the book On page 137, Jacques writes the following, and I invited the ANC on the program. They declined. And if I read these passages, you'll get a sense of why they declined. The SARS commissioner, Opa Makhachula, at first dealt directly with the ANC, with some letters going off to the party demanding immediate payment. This is in relation to the ANC now, um, owing SARS as well as an institution. The ANC wanted SARS to allow it way more time than what ordinary taxpayers get to settle tax debts. Makhachula, Ivan Pillay and Jean Ravella supposedly had meetings with Mkize, that Zueli Mkize, by the way, who looks very sheepish, this is now me speaking, not Jacques, looks very sheepish at the 702 town hall, back at the ranch, this guy has got some questions to answer about the ANC being tax evaders themselves. And then Jacques writes the following. The message from SARS was that the ANC could not ask for preferential treatment. It had to pay up like any other taxpayer. There was apparently a constant exchange between SARS and the ANC, with the matter ev- eventually being assigned to SARS group executive Godfrey Beloy in 2013. In a compromise brokered by Beloy, the investment arm of the ANC, Chancellor House, came to the rescue and made a loan to the ANC which allowed for taxes to be paid. On the face of it, this would have been the end of the matter. But my sources tell me the loan from Chancellor House would have to be repaid by the ANC. If this was not done, then Chancellor House would itself attract tax implications. In 2014, both the ANC and Chancellor House would have had to make some sort of declaration to SARS explaining the loan and demonstrate how it began to repay um, the ANC. My ANC source says that some powerful people within the ANC were livid with SARS for not conceding to their demands to be treated differently. Now, here's the kicker, and this is also why this book is so wonderful. It is not a data dump. There is beautiful narrative that runs throughout it, and the following sentence is very important from Jacques Poe. He writes, It makes a lot of sense why the ANC would not lift a finger while SARS was being swept clean. Absolutely. That's horrifying. Yeah, it is. Because there are some people who believe that the ANC can still rescue itself from Jacob Zuma but what you are chronically in this book Jacques and forget and, and tell me whether I'm over describing the implications is that in fact the ANC itself qua organization is not blameless no they're definitely not blameless you know and when I when I say that that we we are on the brink of becoming a gangster state a mafia state um, it's not only Jacob Zuma that must carry the blame it's also those that And that's what what my book is about. It's about those that have kept him in power and out of prison, and that includes the ANC. Okay. The last thing I want to ask you about is how the book ends. And it's quite ominous because you detail, and the weekend papers carried this part of the ominous ending, the connections between some ANC presidential candidates like Ngozi Zandlamini Zuma and some of these illicit cigarette traders. Mm. But Julius Malema fascinates you. His tax affairs has always fascinated you. And the connections between the EFF and some of these underworld characters, it's almost like a segue into a next book that you need to ask Sam if you can write. She's not going to allow me. But anyway, you know, (laughs) these tobacco smugglers and what people have to realize is that the profits that they make is probably more than the profits out of drug dealing but it doesn't carry such a heavy sentence when you when you get arrested and there are multiple examples of how these tobacco smugglers are trying to get higher connections in order to keep them out of trouble. You know, we, we, we find, for example, that, as I said, you know, one of them, um, KwaZulu Natal based, Yusuf Kaji had Edward Zuma um, um, as one of his directors. 
Um, Mr. Mazzotti, Mr. Adriano Mazzotti, um, who, by the way, was in 2014 presented, him and his company Carnelings was in, were in 2014 presented with a tax bill of 600 million rand plus. And Mr. Mazzotti is also a man looking for higher connections. He already has one connection, and that is Julius Malema. And he, now Mazzotti admits in an affidavit I have uh, that he signed on the 6th of May 2014 that he's a, he's a self-confessed um, smuggler and fraudster and money launderer and he bribed and attempted to bribe officials at, at SARS, um, that he was also looking for his high, higher connections. Now, it's interesting. The other day I phoned Malema when we launched the book in the Sunday Times. I phoned Malema and I, said, and I asked him about Mazzotti and he said Mazzotti is like a brother. Malema said that. Uh, yeah, Malema said that. Mazzotti is like a brother. And I said to Malema, are you aware of who Mazzotti really is? And Malema said, no, can I, and I still have his, his SMS, can you send me the, um, the affidavit, which I, which I haven't done. But anyway, Mazzotti admits in this affidavit that he's given 200,000 rand to the EFF to, to enable them to, uh, to register for the 2014 Elections. Now, obviously, he doesn't think that Malema is going to uh, to deliver soon enough, and he's now put out his his feelers towards and Kosazana Dlamini Zuma. Um, now, first of all, he said he said in his comment to me that he's only met her once, and that was in London when they when they quickly took a photograph and whatever. In the meantime, more photographs have emerged, not only of of uh, Dlamini Zuma and Mazzotti, but also between meetings that um, Dlamini Zuma had with with associates of Adriano Mazzotti. Now, Adriano Mazzotti is also a man who has, for example, just gone into mining, and we all know what that means. He's obviously readying himself for a for an Kuzazana Dlamini Zuma presidency mm. that is going to greatly benefit him, because we all know the Guptas are probably going quite soon and they will eventually go to Dubai and probably never call yeah. JZ again. Yeah. Um, so there's already there's new jackals circling the carcasses um, that want to cash in on the on the on the new regime that's going to, to come to power. Okay. Jacques, when the dust has settled, I want you back on the show because I want to talk about the writing process. Today we focused on the narrative. I must say to you, if you're listening to this, um, as I thank Jacques, what I loved about the book, quite apart from the scary granular detail and the interesting storytelling of the mafia state, is the quality of the writing. And I think if you enjoy books, you will enjoy this book as much for the writing quality as for learning more about your society. He had me in stitches, despite the fact that this is serious stuff. I was hoping, reading the opening segment of the book, that the entire book would be about um, him being a would-be chef in Castilburg. And I want to just end off by reading this to give you a sense of the writing quality, because this book is a literary achievement as much as it is an investigative journalism achievement. And we have, over the years, had brilliant investigative journalists who can't always write and then sometimes you have people who can write but who can't dig and in this book you have someone who can dig and who can write so Jacques has a conversation early on uh, with his partner about you know firstly setting up his new retired life and it turns out that Jacques despite uh, being a very affable character is not exactly the best front of house staff member and eventually got banished uh, back to the kitchen so that he doesn't have to deal with um, the customers and he writes the following the first few months were tumultuous and at times red tin roof resembled a madhouse. The whole village descended on the place on opening night. Our credit card machine didn't work and we collected wads of cash in plastic bags. I grabbed friends and shoved them behind the bar to serve customers. Others were elevated to chefs, to bry sosatis and skullpikes. Then ESCOM switched off the electricity. Whether by choice or not, I have since then been banned to the kitchen. I had early on proved that I lacked the social finesse to deal with customers when I told a Spanish guest to F off when he complained about his Dom Pedro. <laughs> Jacques, I want to thank you for writing this book, both from the point of view of country duty, but also, and I really hope people will sever the book, everyone is excited they can read it in one sitting, that they will enjoy the quality of the writing. Congratulations. Thank you, and thank you for your kind words.